uh, remind everybody really quick about the different levels of radiation risk. Uh, it's kind of important when you talk about nuclear, specifically when you're addressing fear of nuclear, uh, you need to contextualize it. So uh, a millirem is about what you get every day just because you live on the earth. Uh, 10 millirem, that's about the minimum dose that you get because you have to have potassium. Potassium is naturally radioactive. So that's about what you will die without. And that's the, here in the United States, that's the EPA limit to the public, about 10 millirem per year. If you're a large muscular male, you'll probably get about 40 millirem per year because the uh, uh, potassium content scales with muscle. Uh, 100 millirem, uh, that's what you might get for uh, either the public dose limit or to an x-ray to the pelvis or hip if you went and had to have an x-ray like that. Uh, going at, These are all just intended to go up by orders of magnitude to try to scale what people are terrified of. People will actually be terrified of 10 millirem, uh, literally. Um, uh, a half a rem, that's just right above natural background. One rem, that's where the EPA would just start to recommend evacuation, comparable to what happened in, um, uh, in Fukushima. Uh, or in a, I guess if I should have put these in international units, that would be uh, 100 millisieverts. Uh, so, uh, sorry, 10 millisieverts. So the point is, is that uh, this is the same, this dose is what you get for a chest or, or, or hip CT scan. So that's the level of dose that they will start to evacuate. That's how conservative it is. And that terrifies people. They think if, it's, if, if you've got to evacuate me, then it's got to be terrifyingly horrible and scary and risky when it's really not. It's just that's how conservative we are in nuclear energy. 5 rem is actually uh, the legal radiation dose to a, a nuclear worker in the United States. Now, 10 rem, that's where you just barely start to get statistically significant effects and only in very limited cases. Uh, even at 10 rem, if you got 10 rem, you're way below what you would get, to, what you would have to get to see acute radiation syndrome. And if it's real, it's only at about a half a percent cancer probability increase. And that's at 10 rem. Notice we're going up orders of magnitude here. Now, 100 rem, that's a big dose. That's, a, that's, that's about a sievert. And at 100 rem, that, in a year, that would give you about a 5% probability increase of cancer. And this is the kind of dose that you get for the atomic bomb survivors. This is a big dose. And at 1,000 rem, that's about where you die. And so most of the doses we're going to be talking about that people are terrified of are going to be down in this range right here, where there's, there's no measurable medical effects that you would expect from these levels of uh, exposure. And those will terrify people. So we're going to look over the nuclear accidents. Uh, start off with uh, Three Mile Island. Uh, uh, about uh, the average dose that uh, a person got was a, a small fraction of a millisievert. And so it was comparable to natural background and yet it caused terror in people. And so this was the worst accident that we've had in the United States using these 1970s designs. And it was a very expensive accident that, uh, that, that didn't hurt anybody other than just the fear. Fukushima, on the other hand, that also was a Western design uh, back from back in the 70s. And that is considered to have stopped the nuclear renaissance. So we were expecting a nuclear renaissance where we were going to start to uh, really build a lot of nuclear reactors to replace uh, fossil fuels. So let's talk about that. I assume everybody already believes the International Panel on Climate Change. The reason why is because the United Nations put together an expert panel to look at it. And they've done this a number of times. Well, what if they also put together an expert panel to look at the health effects from Fukushima? And what if their findings were to say that there are no expected measurable medical effects? The doses were too low. They were back in those small ranges that I showed you, that back in the range of, say, a REM or less. What if the World Health Organization did the same thing? What if all of the review papers that are out there looked at it said the same thing? And I, I, I reiterate here, what if they said that the, all of the radioactivity from three nuclear reactor meltdowns did not release enough radioactivity to create any expected measurable medical effects? I mean... You think about how much mitigation that is. The worst that could possibly happen with these 1970s designs is that nobody gets hurt. No scratches, no bruises. That's pretty fantastic. And that's what these panels all said. And yet the only measurable medical effects were fear. And that's what they found. A panicked evacuation by the Japanese public killed around a few thousand people. And that was to avoid something that did not have an effect. Kind of like the boogeyman. That's kind of where nuclear energy is, 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 is at in, in many people's minds. Now, Chernobyl, very different. The Soviet design, the Soviet operation, uh, the Soviet uh, emergency response was just terrible across the, across the, the board. However, 
the latest research has had some very profound insight into Chernobyl. So Three Mile Island, Fukushima, these Western designs, uh, they, they operated as behave as expected based on their safety designs from back in the 1970s. But with Chernobyl, there were many, many cancers, uh, a few thousand deaths, something like that. It was substantially less than was originally predicted from linear no threshold. But the research shows that the, uh, even though there were these cancers, that it looks like, again, the biggest death rate is coming from fear. That's what this latest research, research is showing. If you look at cohorts of the liquidators, these are the people that actually went in and were cleaning up the radioactivity and the emergency responders that actually got the, some, some larger measurable doses, even though they weren't seeing any statistically significant increases in uh, cancer, as you might expect for linear no threshold, they saw a large statistically significant increase in suicide. And that comes from the same effect, radiophobia. There is this stigma that was identified that comes with being exposed to Chernobyl radioactivity, that the, the, there's this mindset that whatever wrong or, or problems that you have in life, you can attribute it back to Chernobyl. So if you have gout, or if you have arthritis, or if you have uh, hypertension or high blood pressure or anything else, it's because you have the radiation from Chernobyl so that whenever anything bad happens in your life, it's a self-reinforcing prophecy that left these people without hope. And so they're, according to this research, you're getting more deaths from this. And this is ignoring all of the numbers of uh, unnecessary abortions that occurred as a result of the fear of radiation. So that's just a staggering result that you were actually getting more deaths from fear than actually from radiogenic acute radiation syndrome or even radiogenic cancer, crazy. Nuclear waste, it's actually been identified in the literature as a terror phrase. Uh, that's what uh, uh, Peo found. And uh, it's even been considered a significant societal injustice without any risk uh, uh, analysis, just because of that terror phrase. It's terrifying, it's like the boogeyman, and it's become part of our ethnography to say that nuclear waste is this magic phrase that means that you can't do nuclear energy. Uh, it's, it's just become part of that narrative that is ingrained itself in a large uh, fraction of our society. Well, let's look at it. If you look at nuclear waste, right now, the, new, the United States has the largest fleet of nuclear reactors. We have the largest amount of nuclear energy uh, in any country produced here in the United States. Since the mid-1970s, about 20% of all of our electricity has come from nuclear energy. And all of the spent nuclear fuel from all of that electricity, that's just huge, would not fill up a single football field above three meters high. That should characterize how bad the problem really is. It's just a very small amount of materials that you have for the waste. It's just in a phenomenally high energy density so that, you know, it's shielded with these things. These that you can, once you get outside the fence, you're back near background again uh, in terms of the, the radiation that you would get if you lived right there near the fence of one of these uh, interim spent fuel storage facility installations. And so the problem is readily mitigated, especially since there's just such a small amount of material that's there. Well, what about putting in the ground? How do we know that it's going to be safe? Well, the real trick here is, you know, we don't reinvent the wheel. Let's just look at what Mother Nature taught us from Oklo Gabon. There were some natural nuclear fission reactors that were created here in the Earth. Uh, apparently, they've been throughout all space and time, uh, according to, to this paper uh, that I published recently, uh, maybe on Mars and everywhere else, simply because the fissile component of uranium, uranium-235, it only has a half-life of about 700 million years. Whereas uranium-238, the fissionable or the fertile uh, component has a half-life that's around the age of the Earth, uh, approximately 5 billion years in that range. And so that's why uranium, the uranium-235, has to be enriched. Because of that shorter half-life, over the billions of years that it's been here on Earth, it's decayed much faster than the uranium-238. In other words, it depletes through time as you go forward. But if you go backwards, it enriches. So that shorter half-life for the uranium-235, the fissile component, it becomes much larger in the past. So that around 2 billion years ago, natural uranium would have had an enrichment of around 5%, the same enrichment as you get in commercial nuclear fuel. And so once geology was able to concentrate ores within a few billion years, it was able to have concentrated uranium ore such that with that concentration of uranium ore deep underground, when the water trickled in, it would be enough, it would, it would moderate it enough to allow it to go and fission and become 
uh, a sustained chain reaction until it boiled the water back out. And this kept happening over and over again uh, for some time. And the reason why we know is you look at the isotopics. If you look at the isotopics, if you look at natural neodymium versus what you get from fission, and you see that it's a superposition. What we have at Oklo is a superposition of the, uh, the, the natural neodymium and the terminal fission products. So in other words, what that told, tells us is that the terminal fission products from these natural nuclear reactors, the spent nuclear fuel that was in the ground here, we're able to go in and look at how it evolved, how it di diffused and how it transported through geological media over billions of years. And so we don't need to go in and reinvent the wheel and, 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 and claim that we know what's going on. What we can say, well, we see what actually nature did. And so we can learn the lessons from what happened at Oak Low to be able to control it. And it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward once you look at that. You really just need good geology. And once you have good geology, then you can control it. Uh, I mean, that's where the uranium came from. Uh, it was already concentrated. And because it was concentrated, it, it didn't diffuse itself. But now we can also look at how the fission products behave when they're buried deep underground. So it's a very good example of, uh, 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 of modeling nature. Literature has also shown that the, the, the term Yucca Mountain is, uh, for all intents and purposes, equivalent to tribalism. There is a common narrative that Yucca Mountain is evil. In fact, the literature has actually shown that the New York Times is overtly biased against Yucca Mountain, that they'll only publish uh, uh, articles that are biased against it and they'll only publish facts that, that paint it in a bad light. And so it's become this, this, uh, this uh, a, a common phrase that, you know, that's why you can't do nuclear because of Yucca Mountain. Again, without any risk analysis, uh, looking back, for example, at the risk from those doses, as opposed to what, a what it benefits us, what is the gain that we get versus the risk that we, we take in, 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 in doing that. So there actually is a licensed geological repository in the United States. It's in Southeast New Mexico. It's called the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, and they receive transuranic waste both contact handled and remote handled, and they've been doing that since 1999. Uh, that was the contact handle. Remote handled came later. The point that I, reason why I bring this up is that they actually, like Fukushima, they had this worst case scenario. They literally had a drum deflagration take place in the underground. And why that's significant is that it had safety, safety uh, uh, features engineered into it to, to mitigate any kind of a release. And this is the, the result and release. This is what came from the consequence assessment. When this occurred, uh, if this had been planned and it had been controlled, the entire release would have been within their license. So that the, the license limits the uh, member of the public, uh, the closest member of the public here at the Smith Ranch, they have to get less than 10 millirem per year and it was a fraction of a millirem. It was like a, a fraction of a percent of a millirem. So this would have been completely legal if it had been planned and controlled because the safety features work. And that's typically how you design nuclear power plants is that the worst thing that can possibly happen is that nobody gets hurt. That's pretty much the philosophy that we use, which largely is why they make, they're so expensive because they're designed with that, uh, trying to get to zero risk to appease the public because many people will demand that. They'll say, you have to have zero risk or uh, on this one technology, it's gotta have zero risk or I'm not gonna accept it. Even though we clearly accept much higher risks from other things, but that's a common narrative that uh, that's used uh, in the anti-nuclear community is that it has to have zero risk. Uh, and, and so this is an example of, well, the risk is already really, really low, but for many people, it's not enough. It has to be zero. So what does make something environmentally friendly? Well, the, my definition, and this is just my own personal definition, it's got, it's got a minimal effect on the environment versus the benefit that you gain from controlling nature. And so one of the most, in, in my mind, one of the most poignant metrics is the total life cycle materials that are used per energy extracted. And what that means is if you have a small amount of life cycle materials for energy extracted, then that's less mining, less milling, less transportation, less manufacturing, less logistics, less disposal, life cycle altogether. If you're gonna have something that's environmentally friendly, that's the metric that you need. And what we see is that nuclear is it in spades. Nuclear has the lowest materials per gigawatt uh, hour of all of the, the, the dispatchable baseload energy supplies. And it's substantially better than solar and wind. Just hands down uh, uh, beats them right out. Uh, and it's just because it's got such a phenomenally huge energy density. Well, what about greenhouse gas emissions? Well, nuclear, it scales with all of the others. The funny thing I love, the reason why I particularly like this plot is it shows geothermal over here on the renewable whereas it has nuclear over here on non-renewable. And yet the majority of geothermal energy is nuclear. It's the radioactive decay of the primordial radionuclides, uranium and thorium uh, included, 
And so uh, even though geothermal is listed as renewable, nuclear is not, which to me is just kind of uh, contradictory because it's the same energy source. It's just with nuclear, we take that same heat source and we speed it up. We just get, we extract it really fast instead of letting it happen really slowly uh, throughout the, 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 the body of the earth. So what is the actual uh, energy death rates that you have? I mean, that's really what people tend to argue a lot is what if there's an accident? I need zero risk. Well, zero risk means that you have nobody hurt as a result of getting what you need. And this was a, an OECD report that actually showed that's what you get, at least for the Western countries, if you're using the, the, the Western designs as opposed to the old Soviet designs, um, uh, that, uh, that hydro actually can have huge uh, uh, fatalities. There was a, a hydroelectric dam in China, the Bankyo, which when it went, uh, the common estimates are about 200,000 people died from that dam failure. That's just staggering compared to pretty much anything that you could imagine with nuclear, unless you're dealing with nuclear weapons. And so the, 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 the number that you get for nuclear there was zero. Uh, and that doesn't mean it's, it's zero risk. It just means that it was extremely low risk. So here was a study that looked at what was the death rate uh, from wind. So we didn't have that in this OECD report, but uh, the literature does have that. And so this is actually comes from people falling off of wind turbines, right? Uh, that's an accidental death as a result of taking advantage of wind energy. And so this number, uh, it was about four per 100,000 person hours. And if you look at this, this data uh, compared to the United States, uh, four per 100,000, that puts it at the lowest end. That's like a government worker. That's like really safe. So according to this research right here uh, from uh, Anna Zuris et al., uh, wind energy is really, really safe. It does not hurt people from accidents um, because it's, it's comparable to being, you know, in trade or retail, you know, being a salesperson. But that was for a wind installation. So it did not have a whole lot of energy. So if that's the death rate, if that's a, an acceptable death rate per energy, what would be the same death rate that you would get if we replaced all of that alkaline nuclear energy in the United States with wind? What kind of death rate would we get? If you scale it up, you end up having to have about 2,500. This was for the year 2018. You'd have to have almost uh, uh, two and a half thousand uh, deaths to get the same energy, to have the same safety record as wind. And yet for that year, 2018, it was zero. So how much safer nuclear is than anything else? It's just staggering. And yet the narrative that we have in society is completely the opposite. I would liken it to being an anti-vaxxer. You know, three years ago, it, you hardly find anybody that would say, no, vaccines are bad. I don't, I do not de demand a vaccine have zero risk. But today there are large portions of society that say you have to have a zero risk vaccine or I'm gonna call it deadly and evil and bad. And so it's kind of a similar narrative uh, that we've, we've found with, with, with anti-vaxxers as what we still have today largely with nuclear, that there's this, this, this mindset that it's gotta be zero risk. Uh, otherwise it's evil and bad. Here's an example. Uh, in Budapest in 2011, uh, there was an iodine-131 uh, 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 radioactivity uh, measurement that was found there in the city terrified people, right? It was the, in their minds, it was Chernobyl all over again until they found out it came from a nuclear medicine facility. And then all of a sudden it was okay. The same amount, same radioactivity, same isotope, everything. It was just the source. So electricity is bad, but medicine is good. Uh, that kind of scales it uh, in terms of what the, what the perception is on risk. So uh, that's my presentation. I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Rob. That's an interesting perspective. Is there any questions from the audience? We have already